Yeah, so uh, I'm Michael Lawton. I'm a medical statistician based at the University of Bristol. Um, I've been working on the Discovery cohort since 2013. And I'm going to speak to you today about a really new and modern statistical technique that we're using to look at disease progression, which is called two-sample Mendelian randomization. So the dream for my research is to try and find a factor, some kind of biomarker, that might be causally related to a patient's prognosis. And then we could use this to assist in either developing new treatments or in counseling patients about what their future prognosis might look like. And using genetic data might help us find these causal associations by using this technique to sample Mendelian randomization. So this is a, a schematic of uh, what we're trying to do. And we're trying to determine whether a certain exposure is related to disease progression. This exposure might be another disease, for instance, type 2 diabetes, or it could be a blood biomarker like uric acid or a lifestyle choice, something like smoking. It's anything that we think might predict disease progression. And disease progression could be something like the rate of change in one of the questionnaires that you're filling out when you come to the clinic, or something like time to a developing dementia. The problem we have in an observational cohort like the discovery study is we're often uncertain whether an association between the exposure and disease progression is to, due to some confounder which causes exposure and disease progression. So now I'm going to try and explain to you with a couple of examples of what a confounder is. So let's imagine that someone's been studying mathematical ability in children for years. They go to some primary school and they look at mathematical ability and they, they look at loads of things that might correlate with it and they think that they finally found what predicts mathematical ability. And they find that higher shoe size is related to better mathematical ability. Well, the clever statistician comes along and says, well, there might be a confounding factor there. Have you looked at age? Higher age, you have larger shoe size. Higher age, you also have better mathematical ability. So if we account for age, and as a statistician, I would say you would adjust for it, then you remove this association between shoe size and mathematical ability in children. Another person's been looking at violent crime for years, and they really think they've cracked what causes someone to commit a violent crime, and that's eating ice cream. <laughs> to me, this does actually sound plausible. You might be on the beach, you might drop your ice cream on the floor, and it might set you up into a violent fit of rage. But it might be due to a confounding factor. And here, the hotter the weather is, the more ice cream people eat. And before I wrote this presentation, I didn't realize this, but actually the hotter the weather, the more violent crime this is. And people believe this is down to people going outside more in the hot weather and having more interactions with each other. So when we adjust for the weather, there's no association between ice cream and violent crime. So, this is the situation. We want to see whether an exposure predicts disease progression, but we've got this confounder issue. How can we get rid of it? And it seems like the key might lie in genetics. So we owe a huge debt to Gregor Mendel. In the 1800s, his pea plant experiments established many of the rules of hereditary. And that these are now referred to as the laws of Mendelian inheritance. He's, he's the father of modern genetics. And one of Mendel's laws that he proposed it says that our genes are basically randomly assigned at the point of conception. And the great thing is, because they're randomly assigned before birth, there's no possible confounding factors with disease progression because these all happen after conception. And this is the reason why this technique is called Mendelian randomization.
So this is the situation I keep on going back to. We've got this confounder problem. How do we get rid of it? Well, we also have genetic information on all of the people in our study. And because of this law of Mendelian inheritance, we know that these are randomly assigned and there's no confounder problems. Here's the really clever part. We can take the association between genes on exposure and genes on disease progression, these purple arrows, and using those, we can estimate this blue arrow, so the effect of exposure on disease progression. And this is what we really want to know about. And the reason why it's called two sample is because generally we look at these, this association here in one sample and this association here in another sample. So sample one, the genes on the exposure come from a GWAS. So what is a GWAS? Well, this is a genome-wide association study. So this is a, a picture of a, a piece of DNA. If you stretch out a piece of human DNA, there's about three billion of these base pairs there. And at present in genetic research, we're, we're getting about five to 10 billion of these positions along the genome, and we see whether they're related to a specific exposure. So here, one of the things that we're interested in is chronic inflammation from a blood biomarker called C-reactive protein. And in this study, they had 200, well, over 200,000 individuals who contributed 10 million positions along the genome. And then we look at all of these positions along uh, the different chromosomes and see the ones that are uh, implicated in chronic inflammation. So this is really the era of big data. Some of you might have heard of the UK Biobank. Some of you might even have participated in the UK Biobank. And this has over half a million people in it. It's, it's really one of the biggest genetic studies ever done. So another great thing about Mendelian randomization is this direction of the effect. When we see an, expo uh, an association between exposure and disease progression, it's often hard to know whether it's the exposure causing disease progression or the disease progression causing the exposure. This is something called reverse causation. But because the genes come at conception, we know that they're earlier in time than the exposure. So we know the direction of the effect. So there's no reverse causation there. So here's the schematic again. I've explained to you this first sample from the two sample Mendelian randomization comes from a GWAS study. And where your data comes into it, where the discovery cohort comes into it, is looking at the association between these genes and disease progression. So this is actually my favorite uh, slide from the whole talk. This shows all of the hard work that you guys have put into this study. So uh, when I um, uh, started this analysis back in March, we had about 50% of individuals in the study who had contributed four and a half years worth of data, which is absolutely fantastic. And I dare say that some of you in the audience, some of this 10% have been in the study for seven and a half years, which is absolutely incredible. But for me, as a statistician, bigger is almost always better. So I'd implore you to keep on coming back to the clinic so that in a few years' time, when I'm talking to you, we have 50% of individuals with seven and a half years of follow-up. So this is the amount of data we have. What are we looking at in terms of disease progression? Well, one of the questionnaires that is uh, collected in the clinic is the Movement Disorder Society Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. This is one of the best scales we have to look at motor disability, and it has 33 questions looking at things like tremor and rigidity and postural instability, and we add up all of these questions to get a scale that 
tells us about motor severity. And when we spot, plot this uh, across time, at uh, average at diagnosis, people are around about 23 points and progress on average at about 2.4 points per year. So here's uh, the really complex slide. So we're trying to look at the effect of the exposure on these associations using the two sample Mendelian randomization. Anything to the left of this line means better prognosis. Anything to the right is worse prognosis. We've got these 10 exposures that we're interested in. And these bands here tell us about the uncertainty. And you can see there's quite a lot of uncertainty, especially when we're looking at alcohol and uh, things like beer. BMI and coffee. And the reasons why we were looking at things like this, in some of them, like smoking and uh, BMI, have been implicated in someone's risk of developing Parkinson's. So there's some suggestion that they, they might be neuroprotective in some kind of way. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have enough data yet to draw any firm conclusions. The one really tantalizing association is this blood biomarker here called a polyprotein A1, which looks like higher levels of this protein are related to better prognosis. The unfortunate thing is, when we've tried uh, to validate the assumptions in our model, some of these very complex statistical assumptions, then um, this association actually disappears. So we're still yet to find uh, a really strong causal association. So what we're doing is we're teaming up with our, our sister cohort that's based in Glasgow, the Tracking Parkinson's cohort that started uh, around about the same time as Discovery. And we have collaborated with them before uh, on other papers to increase our numbers and validate our findings. So the big limitation with this method, although it's great that we're able to get rid of this confounding problem, um, it's not going to allow us to simply derive all causal associations with disease progression. And this main problem is because the genetic effects can be so small that as I showed you in that previous slide, there's a lot of uncertainty in our models especially when the samples aren't really large. We need to maybe uh, increase our sample size up to three or 4,000 before we can uh, remove some of this uncertainty. So where are we going to go next with this? Um, well, we're going to be looking at different markers of disease progression, things like cognitive impairment. At present, we've only really looked at the motor disability. Um, we're going to be considering more exposures. And one of the powers of this technique that I think is really great is if tomorrow a study came out and implicated some blood biomarker of being associated with prognosis, Michelle might think, OK, I'm going to go assay this blood biomarker in all of our um, discovery cohort samples. Well, this could take tens of thousands of pounds and lots of time. But if there's been a GWAS study on that particular blood biomarker, we don't need to assay it to get our first associations between exposure. So we can do a preliminary analysis before we go out and spend all this money and time on assaying this blood biomarker. And as I just said from the previous slide, we're going to be including data from our sister cohort, Tracking Parkinson's, to increase our numbers and further validate any findings. And what we're really hoping is someday soon we'll find some exposure that is related to prognosis that will be able to help us to find new treatments or really to counsel patients about the future. So I just wanted to say uh, many thanks to all of you for contributing your time and data, which has allowed all these analyses to be done. And thank you for listening today.